This video contains discussion of topics such as self-harm, drug use, domestic violence, among other disturbing topics. Viewer discretion is advised. Nancy Spongen's death has remained a mystery since its occurrence and the death of her boyfriend four months later, the only suspect in her killing, only added fuel to the fire in terms of speculation. Today the pair have been immortalised as figureheads of the 1970s punk rock movement, but nobody knows for sure what really happened to their hotel room at the Chelsea Hotel on October 12th, 1978. Both came into the world with difficult lives, both displayed themselves as a terrible influence on the other throughout the course of the relationship and both died in very close proximity to one another. It's not difficult to see why this case became so notorious. So, what happened? Nancy Laura Spongen was born on February 27, 1958 to a middle-class Jewish family in Philadelphia in the USA. Raised in the suburb of Lower Moreland Township, Nancy's mother owned a business which specialised in the sale of organic food while her father was a travelling salesman. Nancy was the oldest of three siblings, with her mother and father going on to have another daughter and a son after her. Despite seemingly having a normal and pleasant upbringing, Nancy was a troubled child from the very beginning. As a baby, she cried constantly, and upon entering her childhood years, she became extremely temperamental, throwing violent temper tantrums, threatening family members, and even threatening to stab a babysitter with a pair of scissors. Nancy's mother, Deborah Spongen, writes in her 1983 memoir, And I Don't Want to Live This Life, a mother's story of her daughter's murder. A seven-year-old ran our household. When she wanted something, no matter how big or small, she hollered and screamed and backed us into a corner until we were the ones to back down. We gave in to her. Why? Because there was absolutely no peace in the house until she got what she wanted. At the age of 11, Spongen would set a precedent for her teen years when she was expelled from the public school she attended after a two-week stint of truancy. Her parents, weary of their daughter's delinquency, enrolled her in Devereux Glen Home School, a therapeutic boarding school based in Connecticut, and later Devereux Matter High School in Pennsylvania. In January 1972, Spongen ran away from boarding school and attempted suicide, and later, at the age of 15, she would be diagnosed with schizophrenia by a psychiatrist. Despite Spongen's turbulence and mental health issues, she excelled academically and would go on to graduate from a different boarding school in 1974, enrolling in the University of Colorado at just 16 years old. However, just five months and two arrests later, Spongen would be expelled from the university. This would be the end of her education. At 17, Spongen would leave home for New York City, where she immediately became involved with the punk scene. She became one of the city's most infamous groupies, moving in the same circles as the likes of Aerosmith, the New York Dolls and the Ramones, as well as Debbie Harry and the Heartbreakers. She generally got into the circles of these bands by serving as a drug supplier, and then turned to sex work, amateur music journalism, and unreliable retail jobs as a means of getting by. In the words of Eileen Polk, a photographer in the punk scene who knew Nancy, in order to be a groupie, you had to be tall and skinny and have fashionable clothes. And then here comes Nancy. She's not trying to be cute or charming. She wasn't telling people she was a model or a dancer. She had mousy brown hair and she was a bit overweight. She basically said, yeah, I'm a prostitute and I don't care. While the New York punk scene was full of outcasts, Nancy was starting to become too extreme even for them. She was becoming a bit of an outcast among the other groupies. Eileen Pulse stated of the time, the other girls shunned her and were mean to her and that made Nancy worse. She became vengeful. She kind of reacted to them putting her down by doing even worse things. The only people who didn't shun her were the guys that were getting drugs from her. While she slept with a lot of musicians on the scene, she developed a particular affinity for Jerry Nolan of the Heartbreakers and followed the band over to London in 1976. Nolan, however, rejected her affections and she turned her attention to Johnny Rotten of the Sex Pistols, who also rebuffed her. It would be then his bandmate, Sid Vicious, who would catch her attention, and thus began a tumultuous 19-month relationship. Vicious was born John Simon Ritchie on May 10th, 1957, in Lewisham, London. His upbringing was drastically different to Nancy's. His mother was a secondary school dropout who had joined the army, and his father was a guardsman of Buckingham Palace, as well as a semi-professional trumpet player on the London jazz scene. Vicious had a turbulent childhood with his father becoming absent not long after he was born. He and his mother would move around a lot before eventually settling in Hackney, East London, where he would start attending Clissold Park School. It was around this time Vicious would start going by the name John Beverly after his late stepfather, who his mother had married shortly prior to his death. By 1973, Vicious's mother had kicked him out of her home upon him turning 16 while he was attending Kingsway College. Speaking on Sid's family life, his friend at Kingsway, Jao Wobble, said, It was a big black hole. I met his mother at that time. She had no interest in his life. She didn't even know he was attending Kingsway. She was into the hardcore drug thing, heroin and opiates, which was all embracing. That was her life. While attending Kingsway College, it is reported Sid Vicious frequently struggled with suicidal thoughts and, disturbingly, there were also reports of him torturing and killing cats. While attending Kingsway, Vicious befriended fellow student John Lydon, who would go on to be known as Johnny Rot. Together with John Gray and John Wardle, who would later be known as Jaw Wobble, the friend group became collectively known as the Four Johns, and together they left education entirely and began hanging around Kings Road, Chelsea, 
home of Vivian Westwood's sex clothing store. By this time, Vicious had earned his nickname after he was bitten by Johnny Rotten's hamster, Sid. In 1975, Vivian Westwood's partner, Malcolm McLaren, had recruited Johnny Rotten for the original lineup of the Sex Pistols, and Vicious quickly became one of their biggest supporters. He went on to start his own musical career, co-founding the Flowers of Romance with Keith Levine of the Clash, the Slits Viv Albertine, though ultimately they never performed live nor recorded any tracks. He was briefly considered to become the vocalist of The Damned and performed on drums with Susie and the Banshees for their first gig. Sex Pistols manager Malcolm McLaren took a shine to Vicious's outrageous behaviour at Sex Pistol shows, famously stating, If Johnny Rotten is the voice of punk, Sid Vicious is the attitude. And Sid was heavily encouraged to behave as disorderly as possible at Pistol shows. In 1977, Glenn Matlock exited the Sex Pistols and was replaced by Vicious, despite having no bass experience and not really being proficient in playing the instrument. This was the year Sid Vicious and Nancy Spongin would meet. Both were addicted to heroin by this point and bonded quickly, becoming absolutely inseparable. McLaren, as well as the other Sex Pistols, despised Nancy, with McLaren even planning on having her abducted and returned to America against her will at one point. The relationship quickly became toxic, rife with verbal abuse and violence, however it is also consistently reported that both appeared infatuated with one another and appeared to care about the other person deeply. Both were known to self-harm and both had an obsession with knives. Bob Gruen, who accompanied the Sex Pistols on their US tour, stated of the relationship, I remember talking to Sid on the bus, and he really seemed to care for her. He didn't have any anger or hatred towards her. Sid very much loved Nancy. They seemed to communicate and connect. On the other hand, Johnny Rotten said of the relationship, We did everything to get rid of Nancy. She was killing him. I was absolutely convinced this girl was on a slow suicide mission. Only she didn't want to go alone. She wanted to take Sid with her. She was so utterly fucked up and evil. Regardless of the balance of love and hate in this doomed relationship, it's pretty clear that both parties had a serious appetite for self-destruction and that both were the key catalyst in the other's downfall. The Sex Pistols broke up in 1978 and soon after Nancy Spongin would return to New York with Sid Vicious in tow, showing all of the New York punks who had despised her that she had succeeded in her quest to bag a major punk celebrity. The pair moved into room 100 of the Chelsea Hotel together, under the name Mr. and Mrs. John Simon Ritchie, and thus began the beginning of the end of their relationship. Sid and Nancy initially spent their time in New York City partying and going on drug binges. The couple were always hard drug users throughout the course of their relationship, but things were swiftly going from bad to worse. While Sid was trying to make a name for himself as a solo artist, with Nancy acting as his manager, on the American punk scene, addiction was consuming every aspect of their lives, and this is more so what they were becoming known for, and they were becoming too extreme for even the hardest of partiers in New York. While Sid's American shows did draw in large crowds, his performances, some of which were accompanied by Nancy, were often poorly received. In the 1980 documentary DOA, there's a famous clip of the pair where Sid is nodding off, clearly out of it, and Nancy is instructing him to wake up, reminding him that they're on TV. Television guitarist Richard Lloyd said in retrospect of the couple, Sid and Nancy as a couple were going down the toilet and everybody could see it. To hang out with Nancy and Sid was to make a grievous mistake for your own health. I took lethal doses of everything known. You couldn't call the kettle black, mine was jaw-droppingly black. But I'm still here, they're not. In the book Inside the Dream Palace, The Life and Times of New York's Legendary Chelsea Hotel, author Cheryl Tippins alleges that in the evening of October 11th, 1978, Sid Vicious took approximately 30 tablets of the sedative to and all that left him in a comatose state. This occurred at a party that the couple was hosting in their hotel room, and attendees came and went throughout the course of the night. While it is incredibly difficult to put together an accurate chronological picture of the events that occurred on the night of October 12, 1978, there are for sure certain events that did occur in between the time gaps. At 2.30 in the morning, Nancy begged the actor Rockets Red Glare, a fellow drug addict who sometimes acted as Vicious's bodyguard, to score some Zelotids. Two people who had attended the party and were present at 5am stated when questioned that Nancy was still alive at this point. At 7.30am, the moans of a woman were heard coming from Sid and Nancy's hotel room. At 10am, Sid called down to the reception of the hotel after finding Nancy on the bathroom floor, stating something happened to my girl. The police were phoned. At approximately 10.30am, hotel staff found Nancy's body slumped beneath the bathroom sink of her and Sid's hotel room, wearing only her black underwear. She had bled out from a single stomach wound that had been inflicted on her with a Jaguar Wilderness K11 knife, a knife that she had gifted Sid only a few days prior. Naturally, Vicious was considered the prime suspect. In fact, he was the only suspect who was seriously considered to begin with. That afternoon, he was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. While Sid admitted that he and his ill-fated girlfriend had argued that night, he would go on to give uncertain and conflicting reports of what actually happened regarding the murder. His allegations ranged from taking the knife out but not intending to kill her, to she had fallen onto the knife, to not remembering any of the night's events at all. He would be let out on bail, set to stand trial in the coming months. 
Once let out on bail, Vicious returned to the Chelsea Hotel where he was joined by Malcolm McLaren as well as his mother, both of whom were looking into lawyers for him. Following a psychiatric evaluation, Sid's mother was informed that he must not be left alone at any point by the psychiatrist. Just hours later, Sid was taken to Bellevue Hospital after he attempted suicide by cutting his wrist with a smashed light bulb. He was released three days later on November 26th and returned to his hotel room. In an interview with Irish journalist Bernard Clark two days following this, Sid stated that Nancy's death was meant to happen, stating Nancy always said she'd die before turning 21, and that his deceased girlfriend just wanted to have fun. When asked where he'd like to be himself, he somberly replied, under the ground. Sid quickly became casually involved with a number of women on the New York rock scene following Nancy's passing, and was soon making public appearances again. On December 5th, he attended a Scafish concert and attempted to flirt with the band's drum roadie, a woman named Tara. Tara, at the time, was the girlfriend of Todd Smith, Patti Smith's brother, and rejected his advances. When confronted by Todd Smith, Vicious responded by smashing a beer bottle and jamming it into his face, resulting in an injury that would require Smith to receive five stitches. This led to Sid Vicious once again getting arrested, this time charged with assault on December 7th. He appeared in court January 18th, 1979. Shockingly, not only did the judge issue a $10,000 bond bail release for Vicious, but he also reduced the conditions of his previous bail. Sid spent two months in Rikers Island Prison to complete a detoxification program before being let out on bail. The night of his release, Sid purchased $200 worth of heroin before heading to the residence of actress Michelle Robison, one of the women he was involved with. The couple were joined by Sid's mother, as well as a number of other musicians, including Misfits bassist Jerry Only, who slipped away early in the evening. The heroin was significantly more potent than anyone, especially Sid, could have anticipated. Sid Vicious overdosed on heroin that night and passed away, before he could ever stand trial for Nancy's murder. Upon the news of Vicious's death, the case was closed immediately. His death made international news. As you can probably imagine, such a notorious couple dying in such tragic circumstances, in such close proximity to one another, was a cause for a lot of speculation and sensationalism. What actually happened in room 100 of the Chelsea Hotel that night? Nancy's mother, Deborah Spongen, has stated that while she has no doubt Sid loved Nancy, she also has no doubt that he killed her, although her theory isn't as straightforward as you might think at first. Having raised Nancy and being well aware of her behavioural and thought patterns, Nancy's mother alleges it is likely Nancy instructed Sid to take her life, orchestrating her own death. It wasn't hard for me to imagine what went on that night at the Chelsea. It wasn't hard to visualise Nancy handing Sid the knife she bought and ordering him to prove his love for her by using it on her. Nancy had always insisted that she'd never see her 21st birthday, which would have taken place only the following February from her death. This theory isn't too far-fetched when you take into account some of the more disturbing elements of the couple's relationship. Sid Vicious also wrote some worrying letters to Deborah following being charged with Nancy's murder. The contents of these letters included suicidal ideation, vocalising his grief for Nancy, as well as obsessing over his love for her. These letters have led many to speculate Nancy's death was part of a suicide pact that didn't play out as intended. Sid's grief and desperation for death afterwards was his wish to complete the pact. This is supported by Sid writing. We always knew that we would go to the same place when we died. We so much wanted to die together, in each other's arms. I cry every time I think about that. I promised my baby that I would kill myself if anything ever happened to her, and she promised me the same. This is my final commitment to my love. Sid Vicious's mother was one of the people who supported the suicide pact theory, stating that her son's overdose wasn't an accident. She also found a note in the pocket of Sid's jacket which read, we had a death pact and I have to keep my half of the bargain. Please bury me next to my baby. Bury me in my leather jacket, jeans and motorcycle boots. Goodbye. As Nancy Spongeon was buried in a Jewish cemetery, Sid Vicious's request to be buried with her could not be honoured. Allegedly, Anne Beverly did ask Deborah Spongeon if she may scar Sid's ashes over Nancy's gravesite, although this request was apparently refused. Anne Beverly supposedly ignored this refusal, being driven to the gravesite with two of Sid's friends and his aunt by Jerry only. Journalist Alan G. Parker has claimed that Anne Beverly confessed to him before her 1996 suicide that, in reality, it was she who injected Sid with a fatal dose of heroin, and not himself. Bassist Howie Pyro, who was present the night of Sid's death, believes that Nancy, vying for Sid's attention, stabbed herself that night, hoping Sid would tend to her wounds, but he was too intoxicated. Pyro has stated he doesn't think Sid would have killed Nancy unless she had instructed him to. Malcolm McLaren also protests Sid's innocence, stating, Sid was capable of a wide range of self-destructive acts, but I don't think he could kill someone, especially not his girlfriend, unless it was a botched double suicide. No, I don't believe Sid killed Nancy. She was his first and only love of his life. Neither death stopped Malcolm McLaren and others from profiting off of the situation, however. Following Nancy's death, he had t-shirts released with the slogan, She's dead, I'm alive, I'm yours, scrawled across them. Two Sex Pistols records with Sid's vocals would be released after his death, something else in Come On Everybody, both of which would become top three singles. 
The first of what would become multiple Post Thomas albums, simply titled Sid Vicious, was released in 1980 by Innocent Records, a subsidiary of EMI, who the Sex Pistols had been signed to. In Alan Parker's documentary Who Killed Nancy, he discusses possible other suspects, but certainly other motives for Nancy's slaying the main two being drugs and money. In the documentary, it's hypothesized that given the amount of drugs Sid ingested that night, it's likely it wouldn't even have been possible for him to attempt to kill Spongin. This goes in line with what Polk stated, saying, I think when Sid awoke stoned out of his mind and realized she was dead, he might have assumed that he did it. Six separate sets of fingerprints from previous party goers were found in the hotel room that night, and despite all those identified being known to law enforcement, none of them were ever interviewed. Sid and Nancy had a significant amount of cash in their hotel room. Following Sid's successful version of Frank Sinatra's My Way, as well as his successful run of solo gigs, the couple were in possession of almost $20,000 in cash. When the police investigated the hotel room, all of this cash was gone, aside from some pocket change. Some witnesses allege that a man named Michael, a resident of the Chelsea Hotel and a known drug addict, was later seen with a large wad of cash tied with one of Nancy's hair ties. A very persistent theory points to another party attendee, actor and comedian Rockets Redglare, the man who Nancy had purchased a lot from earlier in the evening. In the book Pretty Vacant, A History of Punk, author Phil Strongman alleges that Nancy had caught the dealer attempting to steal their cash. Upon confrontation, Rockets Red Glare stabbed her in the stomach, took the cash and escaped. Noticing Sid flat out and grey on the bed, Red Glare decided to help himself to a bit more of the couple's cash. Nancy saw the attempted theft and flew at him, nails flying, and copped a bowie knife in her lower abdomen. Nancy slumped to the floor immediately. With no one standing in his way, Red Glare took everything but pocket change and left behind what he believed to be two corpses. Giving further supposed credit to this theory is the fact that the actor was heard bragging about the murder in January of 1978 at the CBGB club. Rockets Regler casually admitted to several fellow drinkers that it was actually he who'd robbed and stabbed Nancy Spongin, and produced a handful of her bloodstained dollars to prove it, wrote Strongman. Rockets Regler has always denied his involvement in the murder publicly, but oddly enough has been known to confess privately to his friends pretty frequently that he did kill Nancy, to mixed reactions. Howie Pyro, however, has always insisted that Red Glare loved attention and these confessions were merely fabricated stories. While the theory of Rockets Red Glare being Nancy's killer certainly holds some weight, it's important to note that it contradicts the accounts of two witnesses, the two who left Sid and Nancy alone in their hotel room at five in the morning with Nancy still very much alive. The fact that another hotel resident heard female moaning coming from room 100 at around 7.30 in the morning further supports the theory that Nancy was still alive when Rockets Regler had made his departure. Multiple drug dealers had come and gone throughout the night of the party, and Regler himself has told police that he believes another drug dealer who was present in the lobby of the hotel that morning was responsible for Nancy's murder. As Rockets Regler himself died in the mid-2000s, it's unlikely we're ever going to get a definitive answer on whether or not he murdered the young groupie. A friend of Red Glare, a punk performer known as Neon Leon, was a resident of the Hotel Chelsea who lived just down the hall from the couple. After Sid's death, Leon was found to be in possession of many items of Sid's, including valuables, but the man maintained these were knowingly given to him by Vicious for safekeeping. However, curiously, Leon would go on to tell the Village Voice newspaper he was well aware of the identity of Nancy's killer. However, he refused to disclose it. This case is obviously the furthest thing from black and white. And with every theory, it means that only one thing is really for certain. The only people who know for sure who murdered Nancy Spongin are Nancy Spongin herself and the definite killer. Sid and Nancy have become one of the most infamous and highly romanticised couples in history in the decades following their deaths. This happened almost immediately with the release of Malcolm McLaren's I'm Yours t-shirts. However, it's only snowballed in the decades that followed. Horror punk band Misfits would release a song titled Horror Business in 1979, the lyrics inspired by Spongin's murder. Prior to the death of Sid Vicious, there were rumours Misfits were going to be backing him on his proposed solo album. While not everyone agrees on Nancy's killer, most in the scene could agree that the whirlwind of chaos surrounding the couple's death stamped a horrific image over the punk scene that it's never quite fully managed to shake. Music journalist Legs McNeil stated, It killed punk overnight. We were doing the Punk Magazine Awards. Lou Reed was there, everyone was there. All the camera crews were there, and they just wanted to talk about Sid and Nancy. It was disgusting. When Vicious died, it felt like the end of the punk movement for many. A lot of bands stopped gigging altogether. A movement that had always kind of been on the fringes of society was now even more segregated. Nancy and Sid, through their legacy and media representation, were losing their humanity in death, now being viewed as little more than symbols of the chaos and nihilism of 1970s punk. Deborah Spongin herself has pointed out that the couple and their relationship have been immortalised as the personification of the punk movement during this time. Punk would later regain popularity in the 80s in a more apathetic form, with bands like Sonic Youth gaining attention. In the 90s, punk would garner worldwide mainstream attention, starting with the release of the punk-infused Nevermind album from Nirvana, and so the movement continued to evolve in multiple different ways, nowadays heavily associated as a brand rather than a movement. 
Director Alex Cox released the biopic Sid and Nancy in 1986, which in hindsight seems like a shockingly short amount of time after someone's death to be releasing a biopic about them. Sid and Nancy are played by Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb, and the movie chronicles the relationship from their first encounter until Nancy's death. The movie's version of events supports the theory of a suicide pact, however they become hostile towards one another when Vicious changes his mind. Nancy goes on to assault Sid and is stabbed accidentally as she doesn't realise Sid's knife is out. The movie has received criticism for its glamorization of the events that occurred, and when asked what parts of the film were accurate, Johnny Rotten curtly replied, the name Sid. Veronica Chenu's story Rats is heavily inspired by the life of Nancy Spongen. The author has stated of Rats, I wrote Rats because I was angry with the way the recent coffee table histories of punk seem to have no problem with demonising a dead, mentally ill teenage girl. A recent poor taste decision by celebrities Kourtney Kardashian and Travis Barker to dress up as the deceased couple for Halloween is perhaps a perfect encapsulation as to how Sid and Nancy are no longer viewed as two individuals who had tragically short lives but rather as pop culture symbols. In Danny Boyle's 2022 miniseries Pistol, Sid and Nancy's relationship makes up one of the series' plots, though thankfully probably not as much as you might expect at first. The saga takes place over the course of the final two episodes. Sid and Nancy are played by Louis Partridge and Emma Appleton in this version of events. Sid is shown waking up the morning after Spongeon's death, confused and unaware, with only a vague recollection of the previous night's events. He then finds Nancy dead in the bathroom, seemingly acknowledging Sid's version of events where he has no memory of the previous night or how Nancy may have died. Regardless of whether you believe Sid and Nancy were outright terrible people, blame one party rather than the other, or believe they were both just lost souls who were victims of poor circumstances, you'd be hard pressed to deny the tragedy of the circumstances of their deaths. Nancy has been demonised over and over again in the rock and roll scene, even in the modern day, despite the fact that we're all well aware she was psychologically unwell, and died at a tragically young age. Sid has gone on to be the first thought for many when punk music is mentioned. Despite being a notably flawed musician, his attitude and persona have massively impacted the punk stereotype. The examples mentioned probably aren't going to be the last of many retellings and discussions of their story. The chaos of their relationship, as well as the mystery surrounding Nancy's passing, is simply too enthralling for most audiences to ignore.